Let's bless his name together. Baruch Hu Ad Adonai HaMevorach Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Le'olam Ba'ed Blessed be the Lord who is blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. From Devarim Deuteronomy 6, the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kivod Malchuto Le'olam Vaid Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Praise be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever. Amen. And when Messiah was asked the question, Rabbi, what is the most important command? He answered with the words of the Shema and said the following. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Messiah then said, the second command is like unto the first, v'yahavta l'recha kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We're going to sing some songs, especially on this day. Today is the 44th day in the counting of the Omer. On Tuesday was the 40th day of the counting of the Omer, which is when Yeshua ascended after talking with the disciples for 40 days and instructing and teaching them. And then he told them to wait until they're endowed with power from on high. And Shavuot was 10 days later, and that's when we see the outpouring of God's Spirit. As that small group of people who just lost their leader and thought it was all over, turned the world upside down because they were united and they didn't fear what the world could do, but they trusted God. So why should we fear? If God is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. So we're going to start with that. If God before us, who can be against us? If God is for us, why live in despair? If God is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. If God is for us, we have no need to fear. And if God who provides, everything is for us. Why focus any longer on what we lack without Him? Oh yes, if God who provides, Everything is for us. Why focus any longer on what we lack without Him? So draw near, don't delay. Turn your heart towards Him today. Yes, draw near and obey. Walk with Him and just say, If God before us, who if God is for us, why do we live in despair? If God is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. If God is for us, we don't need to fear. Oh yeah, if God is for us, who can be against us? When God is for us, He shows us He cares. And we 
people ask me how am I doing I answer back and I say it's always better than I know and getting better every day cause God goes beyond what I think or imagine and that is why I boldly say if God before us who can be against us if God is for us why choose to live in despair if God is for us it doesn't matter who's against us if God is for us we don't need to fear so draw near God before us, who can be against us? If God is for us, why choose to live in despair? If God is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. If God is for us, we don't need to fear. Oh yes, if God is for us, who can be against us? When God is for us, he shows us his care. We rise above every fear because God is with us. And you know, one of the things that we celebrate yesterday was Yom Yerushalayim, the day of Jerusalem, when God in his timing at his moment brought back, as he promised, Jerusalem back into Jewish hands. Messiah prophesied and said, Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Gentiles till the time of the Gentiles has run its course. So he predicted both the destruction and the restoration of Jerusalem. And today we're going to be talking about it all adds up in God's calculation. And in God's calculation, the disciples thought maybe it should happen right away. We'll be looking at that a little bit later also. But he said, the father knows the time. And of course, it was around 2,000 years later. But God brought Jerusalem back into Jewish hands and that started a new cycle of God's revival power happening in 1967. And so we're grateful for that. So we're going to play the Jerusalem video. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for God's peace over all of them. May they prosper who love you. May God's peace be within your walls. And he will give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for all the sadness. He'll bring them garments of praise for all the tattered and the torn. Yes, he will give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for all the sadness. He'll bring them garments of praise to heal the weary and the worn. May his peace be within their walls. For over 3,000 years, we have looked to this city and dispersed throughout the earth. You now have brought us home again. We will never keep silent just like the watchmen on the wall till Jerusalem is established as a praise in all the earth yes we will give our eyes no sleep and give him no rest till he establishes 
demolishes Jerusalem so that all the world is blessed. So we pray for the peace of Jerusalem and pray for God's peace over all of them. May they prosper who love you. May God's peace be within your walls. Cause God has brought us beauty out of ashes. The oil of joy to soothe all sadness. He brought us garments of praise for all the tattered and the torn. Yes, you have brought us beauty out of the ashes. The oil of joy to soothe all our sadness. You brought us garments of grace to clothe all the weary and the worn. May God's peace be within our walls. Shalom, shalom, Yerushalayim. Shalom, shalom, Yerushalayim. Shalu Shalom Yerushalayim 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 God is faithful to fulfill the things that he promises to do and that was an amazing move of God's spirit but the timing is not always what we expect the timing is not always what we plan. And God is always on time in his scheme of things, the way he calculates everything. And we're grateful for all of that. We're going to conclude this portion with Ein Kelohenu, uh, none like our God, because when it comes down to it, what God is there that can make promises like God has made and then fulfill them and not worry about time or lifespans, but has all eternity to be able to bring about the things that he wants to do and is going to do. If he said it, he'll do it. If he spoke it, he will bring it to pass because he's faithful. You alone are our God. 
Jesus, you alone are our God. You alone are our Lord. You alone are our King. You are our Savior in everything. And to you we bring our incense of praise. Let's worship Him. Blessed are you. God is so good, isn't he? He is so amazing. And we have nothing to fear as we yield ourselves to him. Shabbat shalom. We welcome everyone to Beth Zion. We're glad you're here with us today. And for all those who are watching on the broadcast as well. And our calling as a congregation on this day, actually, I should mention too. It is the 44th day of the counting of the Omer. And on Tuesday was the 40th day. And we're going to be looking at one point, touching on that aspect in the reading today. But it's amazing that on the 40th day is when Messiah ascended. And he had spent 40 days instructing his disciples. And then he said, wait until you're endowed with power from on high. And they waited and on Shavuot, there was a great move of God's spirit. And we're in that last week leading up to Shavuot, which would be next week. Or as in the church, they refer to it as Pentecost. It's the 50th day after Passover. And we are celebrating with anticipation of a harvest. And that's really what it is. But we don't have the agricultural focus anymore. So we're looking for a spiritual harvest to come and people's hearts to be open and see God do something that we can't imagine. Our calling as a congregation is to declare Messiah to the Jewish heart of central Jersey and to share the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes. We seek to do that each week as we come together. We look at the Torah and the Haftorah portions. We look at the new covenant and how it relates to those portions. And as our people, our Jewish people all over the world are looking at those Torah portions, there are deep messianic meanings in all of those things. And we try to bring those things out and be able to understand that so that we can relate to and discuss these things with our neighbors, with our friends, with all people. And you don't have to be Jewish just to understand that either. It's the foundation of our faith, it's the foundation of everything. And we're grateful for the opportunity to be able to share those things and to do it in a way that will bring about transformation in the communities around us. We've got to believe, whether by many or by few, the power of God is not restrained, but the power of God can be poured out and bring about transformation. You know, it was back in the 60s, the late 60s, early 70s, when the Jesus movement started. And it was out of nowhere, it seemed like, that it happened. And you had a little church that was diminishing, 
And all of a sudden, all of these young people started coming in. And before you knew it, there was a move of God's spirit to the point where millions of people have come to know the Lord and the ministries that developed out of that. All those things birthed in the small things that God was doing because God, whether by many or by few, is able to accomplish the things that he says he will do. And so when we share the message of Messiah in its original context, it becomes clear to everyone, Jew and non-Jew alike, that this is a Jewish faith for the whole world. And Messiah is at the center of it. We have our basket in the back for the tithes and the offering. If you would like to, we have envelopes there and you can fill that out and place those offerings in the basket back there. Or you can go to PayPal on our website at bethzion.org. Or you can mail it to Beth Zion, P.O. Box 807, Jackson, New Jersey, 08527. And we're grateful for all of your prayers, your generous support, and the way that God is knitting us together for a purpose and plan that's in his heart. Avinu Malkeno, our Father and our King, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your word. We ask you to open up our hearts to hear what your Ruach, what your spirit would say to us as we consider the portions today and ask you to make it applicable in our hearts and our lives that we would walk in a new manner, in a new intimacy with you and see you do exploits in our midst. We thank you, Father, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Today's portion is called Bamidbar. It means wilderness. And it is taken from, this is where we begin in the book of Numbers. And Bamidbar doesn't mean numbers. It's mentioning numbers because it starts off with the census that follows. But it's taken from the first verse of chapter 1 of Bamidbar, Numbers, where it says, Hashem spoke to Moshe in the Sinai desert, in the tent of meeting on the first day of the second month, on the second year after they left the land of Egypt. And he said, take a census of the entire assembly of the people of Israel by clans and families. Record the names of all the men, 20 years old and over, who are subject to military service in Israel. And when we look at this, Bamidbar means wilderness, the desert, the wilderness. And it's very interesting to see how the focus, normally we think of a wilderness as something that is desolate. And yet, as we look through these portions, we're going to find that our calculations are not always the same as God's calculation of things and reckoning what things mean and how they are and all of that. And so what we're going to look at a little bit here is not so much the reference to the numbers and the tribes and all of those things, but we're going to look at what it means to be counted. The title for this is, It All Adds Up. It All Adds Up. And then I have down below that, in God's calculation. It all adds up in God's calculation. It doesn't always seem to figure the way we plan in our own calculation, but this image that we have on the screen is somebody sitting back and looking at a chalkboard with all of the calculations, all of the details and all the figures to try to figure something out. And as complicated as it may look, it's not that complicated to God. And when we go through this, God has a way of working everything for good. His purpose and his plan as we yield ourselves to him. And so we're going to look for a moment at a couple of things. One is that they were taking a census and they were just evaluating what the numbers were and what they had. And this is something that God actually said to do, to give them a sense of what they were working with and for all the people to be a part of it. It wasn't to make a census on their own. And so when we look at it, 
it says that they took a census of the entire assembly in the desert. And there's an interesting passage I want to look at for a moment, and that is in the book of Hosea, which is part of the Haftorah portion. And it's kind of an interesting one. It starts in chapter 2, verse 1. But I want to go back for a minute to the verse, verses just before that in chapter 1, where God instructs in chapter 1, <laughs> instructs Hosea to do something very unusual. And I, I, I don't know that I would recommend this as part of a kind of a thing of a matchmaker coming up with this kind of a decision. But in the book of Hosea, he tells him to go and marry a whore. <laughs> you say, what? And have children with her. And he talks about this as a living illustration. He says, for the land is engaged in flagrant whoring, whoring away from the Lord. And one of the things that you see in the scripture and in the Torah especially are the warnings of not following after idols, not getting caught up in their temple prostitutes and all these other things that the nations had going on around them because they will draw you away from your fidelity to God, draw you away from the relationship that he wants to pour out upon us. Now, when people are trying to evaluate, they may say, well, that doesn't add up. I mean, if, if it feels good, do it. That was one of the things they said back in the 60s, right? If it feels good, do it. They didn't recognize what all of the consequences of those actions would be and all of the STDs and everything else that followed and all of the deterioration of our social network and everything else that was going on as a result of it. They didn't foresee that because they were calculating only what they wanted to see as what they thought was important at the time. Maybe since I was in my teens at that time, I could say we all thought it was a good idea. It sounded like it made sense, but the overall scope of what God was doing was figured from a different calculation. And when we go through this, he says this, he's telling them this, he says, and I want to point out that no matter how bad it may seem, God has a way of turning things around. In that same chapter, chapter one of Hosea, he says, she conceived and bore a son. And then it says in verse six, she conceived and bore a daughter. Name her Lo Ruchama, unpitied. Who would name their kid unpitied? <laughs> For I will no longer have pity on the house of Israel. By no means will I forgive them, but I will pity the house of Yehuda. I will save them not by bow, sword, battle horse, or cavalry, but by Hashem, their God. After weaning Lo Ruhama, she conceived a boar son. The name of that one was Lo Ami. Not my people. Can you imagine naming your kid that way? What kind of a complex would they grow up with? I'm called not my people. Well, who are you associated with? Not my people. I mean, this is really very, very sad. Because you are not my people and I will not be your God. That sounds pretty adamant and pretty much like there's no room for wiggle room at all in that. And yet, in the next verse, chapter 2, verse 1, he says, nevertheless, and I think there is no better placement for nevertheless than in this chapter. Nevertheless, the people of Israel will number as many as the grains of sand by the sea, which cannot be measured or counted, so that the time will come when instead of being told, you are not my people, it will be said of them, you are the children the living God. And he says in verse three, say to your brother, Ami, my people, to your sister, Ruhama, pitied. And it is this promise that God is making that he will restore them. In verse nine, he describes here, he says, she will pursue her lovers, but not catch them. She will seek them, but won't find them. Then 
she will say, I will go and return to my first husband because things were better for me than they are now. For she doesn't know it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil. I who increased her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. All of the things that were given to her by God, she offered up to Baal, to foreign gods. And then he says this, and I, I love this verse because it seems contrary to the way that we calculate things. I mentioned before, it all adds up in God's calculation. But in our calculation, it doesn't make sense. We would look at it and say, in this verse, he says in verse 16, he says, but now I am going to woo her. What is he going to do? Is he going to bring flowers and chocolate? What's he going to bring her? I will woo her. Will he give like a smile and a swoon? I don't know. He says what it is. I'll bring her out to the desert. Uh, doesn't sound too romantic. And I will speak to her heart. Now, why does he say, I will bring her out to the desert? What is it about a desolate place? What is it about a place where you have no reference for all the things that you think and calculated to be the most important things in your life? And now they're gone. You're there and there's no distractions. All you see is desolation. And yet he says there, I will speak to her heart. Why does he say this? Because when he often, in a way, he brings us into the wilderness to bring us out of all of those complicated, compromising areas in our life. All the things that are flashing before us for attention to draw us away from the Lord and to something that promises but cannot produce. He says just a little bit further down in verse 21, I will betroth you to myself forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness, in justice, in grace, and in compassion. I'll betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you will know Hashem. You will know the Lord. He speaks in very intimate terms of wanting to have that relationship with us. And in the midst of starting off by saying, you are not my people, he says, you are my people. He is making provision for us to bring us back again. And he says at the end, I will have pity on lo ruchama, unpitied. I will say to lo ami, not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. There's something about the way we respond to the unconditional love of God. When we begin to see how God figures things differently than we do and how he doesn't abandon us, though for a season we may feel abandoned, God wants to bring about a transformation in our lives. When we go down a little bit further into in the book of Luke, I mentioned this is sometimes they have this in messianic references for a new covenant portion because it references the census that the emperor Augustus was issuing forth. And this is when Yeshua, who wasn't born yet, was coming in his pregnant mother and Joseph and they were coming back to do the census and it mentions here that there was no room in the inn and all of these things. But what's interesting is that God was working something out. And in the midst of it, there was an explosion of life. The Shekinah, the glory of God shone in the field. And it wasn't a large crowd. These were shepherds that were there. And what it says that the angel said to them, don't be afraid because I am here announcing to you good news that will bring great joy to all the people. In the highest heaven, glory to God on earth, peace among people and goodwill. And you see these elements that are there. And even though you can't fully understand sometimes what or they couldn't have understood what 
the full scope of that meant. It mentions in verse 19, Miriam, Yeshua's mother, treasured all these things and kept mulling them over in her heart. When we think about what God is doing and what his word says, we need to mull these things over in our hearts. We need to allow them to take root within us, to recalculate in our own lives what is actually going on, what the circumstances mean, and how God is beyond the circumstances and yet uses those things to bring about transformation and change for us. When we go to another point, you know, it mentions the child grew and lived in the wilderness until the time came. You know, it's interesting that he lived in the wilderness until the time came and then was brought back to the land, brought back as a child of promise. Very, very powerful to think about how God will bring us oftentimes into a, what seems like a, a desolate place. But he doesn't bring us there to make us desolate. He brings us there to bring about the contrast of the abundance of what God wants to produce in our lives as we yield ourselves to him. And even though the circumstances may not be what we expect and our calculations may be off, God's calculation is never off. It's always working for our good. He mentions this, that we look at the body in, in 1 Corinthians 12, and we see in verse 12, he says this, For just as the body is one, but has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, constitute one body, so it is with the Messiah. And he says, we are one body. For indeed, the body is not one part, but many. And this is where he says, if the foot says to the hand, I have no need of you, you know, we look at all the division that there is in the world right now. And if you're not lined up specifically, I mean, if you happen to be a foot person, you have no need for hands. You're a hand person who needs the feet. And the fact of the matter is that as we divide against one another, we are actually cutting off our ability to coordinate for what God wants to accomplish because there's a coordination of the many parts coming together, as different as those parts may be, God has a way of bringing us together and calculating just how each part will fit in and how each part will support one another. And if we don't do that, we begin to divide ourselves over our differences, we actually become crippled in our ability to do anything uncoordinated in being able to follow through on the things that God wants to accomplish. Now, God will accomplish it. He may not use us. But when we put him first, he puts us in a position where we can be used by God to be able to see these things come together. He calls us together in one body for one purpose, and that is to expand the kingdom of God. He says in verse 27, now you together constitute the body of Messiah and individually you are parts of it. We are not the whole enchilada. I know today the focal point will be if I want to get my selfie with everybody or I want to go to a museum. You look at people go to a museum to see all the artifacts and what they really want to do is get their picture next to an old image or an old and all the focal point is on ourselves there's something wrong it's a selfie generation a selfie time and God wants us to see a bigger picture of how we coordinate together and how we come together for a purpose that is beyond ourselves you know it's interesting that he was talking about all of the different elements that are there uh, not all are emissaries not all our prophets, teachers, miracle workers, not all have gifts of healing, not all speak in tongues, not all interpret, do they? Eagerly seek the better gifts, but now I will show you the best way of all. And then he speaks of the love chapter, chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians, and says how amazing that can be. 
I want to look for a moment in Romans 8. Because here, when we look at calculating how things are going in our life, we make the mistake of calculating it based on all of the calamity that's going on in our life. We evaluate things by how bad things are. We end up focusing our attention on how destitute and how desolate everything is. And why would he put me in a wilderness to get our attention? He's not calling us. That's not our destination. That's what we pass through on the way to where God wants to bring gold into our life. And he says in Romans 8, I was looking at one particular verse, 28, but I want to start in verse 18 because I think it sets up for us the way that we struggle over circumstances that come across in our life that we don't understand. And we try to calculate what it means. But if we don't have access to God's new math, if we don't have access to the way that God calculates things, we can come up with some very strange theories. And he says this in verse 18. I don't think the sufferings we are going through now are even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us in the future. Now, it's hard when you're going through the sufferings to consider that the future could be better. It seems like this is just the way it is. This is my final destination. It's not. It's what we're passing through at the moment. And I can't say how long that moment will be. We're going to look in a moment in the book of Acts and see that there were certain things people had in mind. But let's just look for a moment here. He says, the creation waits eagerly for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was made subject to frustration, not willingly, but because the one who subjected it. But it was given a reliable hope, a reliable hope, that it too would be set free from its bondage to decay and would enjoy the freedom accompanying the glory that God's children will have. So when people talk about the environment, the planet, if we are following through in the way that God says to do, the whole planet is actually convulsing, waiting for the sons of God, the daughters of God to be revealed so that they also will be able to experience it. We mentioned last week when we talked about the the Jubilee and we talked about the Shemitah and how they would let the land rest and that when they went into captivity for 70 years, it was because they never gave the land its rest and said the land got its rest as they went into captivity and then were restored back again. God does not want to leave us in captivity, doesn't want to leave us in places of consternation and fear, doesn't want to leave us in those desolate places, but we pass through and we need to learn the lessons. And I'm not saying that we have to figure out what that lesson is, but we yield ourselves to God and understand that his way of calculating things is different than ours. And so he says, I don't think the sufferings we're going through now are even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in the future. He says this in verse 26. Similarly, the spirit helps in our weakness, for we don't know how to pray the way we should. But the spirit himself pleads on our behalf with groanings too deep for words. Now, some people think that that's talking about tongues. Tongues is another thing that's in the scripture that is a self-edifying experience that God uses to edify us in our spirit. But here he's saying there there are these things that the Spirit himself pleads on our behalf with groanings too deep for words. That means, you know, when you're going through something and the convulsion that you feel, it's sort of like, oh, God, oh. And we can't put into words, but we're experiencing that struggle. And the Spirit of God is expressing with groanings too deep for words. You can't explain it. Don't try to explain it. We're always trying to explain to everybody what the difficulties mean. We don't know what it means yet because we don't know God's calculation for what he's looking to accomplish with it. So why would we try to figure out what we don't know? 
What we need to know is him. What we need to know is how to draw near to him. What we need to know is to spend time in his word and to experience his blessing. But he says the spirit helps us in our weakness. And when we go through those desert times, those wilderness experiences, we feel our weakness. We feel our fragility. We feel our, our frailty and our inability to move forward. And he helps us in those places. And then he says this, and the one who searches hearts knows exactly what the spirit is thinking because his pleadings for God's people are according to God's will. They accord with God's will. And then verse 28, furthermore, we know that God causes everything to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, what's interesting about that, I, I never forget, I was at a conference one year, a Messiah conference, and Richard Wormbrand was speaking there. And he was telling about a pastor who had been imprisoned at the same time. And he would told the story he said, and I, I've never forgotten, I always think of it, this verse, every time it comes up, that was an impact message for me because he said he was talking to his students and he was saying, everybody reads the passage wrong. It's just not true that all things work together for good. And I said, how can you say that with what you went through? How can you say that? He says, no, people read it wrong. They read it with qualifications. He says, but you have to read it this way. All things work together for good to those who love God or according to his purpose. But see, we approach it as all things work together for good, except with these clauses, because this can't be God working, and this can't be right, and this is wrong, and why would he allow this to happen, and why? All of these qualifications, there are no qualifications. God will utilize all of it to work it together for our good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. This is part of God's calculation. It all adds up when we follow God's prescribed way of approaching it. We know that he causes everything to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Because those whom he knew in advance, he also determined in advance, would be conformed to the pattern of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. You know, it's interesting, the firstborn among many brothers, the first fruit. What's interesting is the a couple days after Passover, we talk about a word there uh, that, that is speaking about the first fruit of the harvest. And then as we count down this period of the counting of the Omer to the time of Shavuot, they refer to it as Yom HaBikarim, Shavuot, as Yom HaBikarim, the day of first fruits. And all of these are a part. Messiah was the first fruit among many brothers. Many brothers, I was going to say brethren, so it came out as brothers. Okay. <laughs> but he is the first fruit. But it also means that we will follow through in the same way that he was victorious. His victory becomes our victory as we move forward. Then he says, verse 31, what then are we to say of these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? Now, Somebody may cynically say, well, everybody's against us. Everybody's against me. It's all falling apart. It's no good. But he's not saying, if God is for us, who could be against us for you to list all the ones that could be against us? He's not looking at it to measure it out that way. That's not how he calculates it. What he's saying is, if God is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are saying. It doesn't matter what people are saying because we serve God. And as we yield ourselves to him, he will make all things work together for good. And one of the characteristics we mentioned before uh, that is really so amazing too 
We mentioned before in, in the Corinthians 12, where it talked about all of us working together, supplying what each joint requires, each person coming together and doing their part. But then he also says that the greatest of these is love. And he goes into describing that love. But here at the end of Romans, he brings love in again. He says, what then are we to say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare even his own son. Well, that can't be calculated correctly. Why would he not spare his own son? But gave him on our behalf or on behalf of us all. Is it possible that having given his son, he would not give us everything else too? Well, it doesn't seem like it. No, don't go by that calculation. Look what God says. So who will bring a charge against God's chosen people? Well, it seems like everybody who doesn't like God is bringing a charge. No, it's not that we focus on who's bringing a charge. Certainly not God, it says. He's the one who causes them to be considered righteous. Who punishes them? Certainly not the Messiah, Yeshua, who died and more than that has been raised. He's at the right hand of God and is actually pleading on our behalf. Who will separate us from the love of Messiah? Trouble, hardship, persecution, hunger, poverty, danger, war. As it says in the Tanakh, for your sakes we are put to death all day long. We are considered sheep to be slaughtered. Next verse, no. Verse 37, no. In all these things, we are super conquerors through the one who has loved us. I'm convinced that neither death, now listen to this list of things. Whatever you're going through, look at this list of things and see if it doesn't come into some of these categories. I'm convinced that neither death nor life, those are pretty big ones, Neither angels nor heavenly rulers, neither what exists nor what is coming, neither powers above nor powers below nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which comes to us through the Messiah, Yeshua, our Lord. God's love can carry us through all of those things. And we got we have to stop ruminating on just the negative traits of it, because we will never come to God's calculation of things if we're only going by our calculation of what we think it means. God will bring us through. I want to mention this also, because if you look in the book of Acts, in Acts 1, it's interesting. I mentioned before that we are at day 44 in the counting of the Omer. Tuesday was day 40. Tuesday would have been the day in the counting of the Omer that Messiah ascended into the heavens. And this is the description that was given in the book of Acts. It says this. Verse three, after his death, he showed himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. During a period of 40 days, they saw him and he spoke with them about the kingdom of God. He didn't speak to them about the oppression of the Romans. He didn't speak to them about all of these different things. He didn't say what a travesty it was that he was executed. He didn't speak about those things. He spoke about the kingdom of God. At one of these gatherings, and I find it so amazing that after they saw the resurrected Messiah, after they had their hopes shattered by the one they thought was going to be the Messiah, was killed and executed, and they thought, well, that was short-lived. They were upset, to say the least, but they were calculating it wrong. And what it says is after his death, and he showed many convincing proofs that he was alive. During a period of 40 days, he spoke with them about the kingdom of God. And then this is interesting because It's sort of a throwback to the way they calculated things. And what does it say in verse 4 of Acts 1? At one of these gatherings, he instructed them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father promised, which you heard about from me. For Yochanan used to immerse people in water, but in a few days you will be immersed in the Ruach HaKodesh. When they were together, 
They asked him, and this is the part I'm talking about here, still didn't have a clue. Even with all of this, seeing the resurrected Messiah, seeing all of the teaching that he was giving about the kingdom of God, here's what they said. Lord, are you at this time going to restore self-rule to Israel? His answer, are you kidding me? <laughs> no, his answer was, you don't need to know the date or the time. The Father has kept that under his own authority. But here's where you need to focus. You will receive power when the Ruach HaKodesh comes upon you. You will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Shomron, indeed to the end of the earth. And then he ascended into the heavens. And it says, as they were saying, as he was, after saying this, he was taken up before them in the cloud, hidden from their sight, as they were staring into the sky after him. Suddenly they saw two men dressed in white standing next to them. The men said, you Galilean, psst, psst, over here. <laughs> Why are you standing staring into space? This Yeshua who has been taken away from you into heaven will come back to you in just the same way as you saw him go into heaven. What were they doing? They were once again making a calculation. Well, now he's gone. What are we going to do? <laughs> he went into heaven. What am I going to do? And they said, why are you staring into space? Stop it. Begin to go to do what he said. Go to Jerusalem. And I, I love the fact, too, and I'll mention it again next week when we talk about Shavuot. But it always amazes me. People talk about the upper room experience. The upper room experience was the bed and breakfast where they stayed when in Jerusalem. It wasn't where the outpouring of the spirit came because it said what was going on. You know, you see a lot of these documentaries or you see these movies where the disciples were fearful and hiding in an upper room, trying to keep away from the authorities in the Jewish community and from the Roman soldiers and all of that. But it doesn't say that. The last verse in the book of Luke, which was written by Luke, and Acts was written by Luke, so he knew what was in the other book. He's continuing it here. And it says in the very last verse, and every day they were in the temple praising God. Every day they were at the temple praising God. During the 10 days that were left in the 50-day count, they were in the temple praising God. They weren't hiding. They didn't know what to expect, but they were in one mind, in one accord, in one place. They began to go with the calculations that God was giving them, the figures God was giving them. They were walking in obedience to him. And to their amazement, all of the manifestations that we'll talk about next week took place. And God changed everything. The trajectory was very different than they expected. And all of a sudden, Peter stood up and spoke with boldness. And thousands of people responded as he stood up in the temple area and spoke forth prophetic words of God. I know Peter wasn't up all night preparing a message. He wasn't thinking about presenting anything in the temple because he would have no authority to do it. But by God's calculation, it all added up. And in that moment, with all the manifestations that took place, God gave Peter the floor and he spoke with authority and with power. We are living in a time when we need to speak with authority and with power. And we need to make a distinction between the clean and the unclean, between those things that that try to draw us away from God and how we draw near to God. And what is it that we see in Matthew? In Matthew, it was kind of interesting because, <laughs> because here we find chapter 16, verse 21. From that time on, Yeshua began making it clear to his Tamadim, his disciples, that he had to go to Yerushalayim. I mentioned that yesterday was Yom Yerushalayim, the day of Jerusalem. 
And isn't it interesting that even in the calculations that were laid out there, they said, are you at this time going to establish self-rule in Israel? Only the father knows. According to their calculations, they're expecting that they would be in charge pretty quickly. That everything would be taken care of. The Romans would be removed like, like the Maccabees experienced in their time. Their calculations were definitely off. What they didn't count on was that God's calculation, the Father's calculation, was Jerusalem would return again. Yes, the promise kept. About 2,000 years later, I mean, think about that, how off they were. And what he says here, he says, from that time on, Yeshua began making it clear to his Talmudim. This is before he had his death experience. He had to go to Jerusalem, endure much suffering at the hands of the elders, the head Kohanim and the Torah teachers, and that he had to be put to death. But that on the third day, he had to be raised to life. Now, he's telling them something very plainly here. They didn't fully understand it. Maybe Kepha began, Peter began to understand a little bit because he says, he took him aside. He said, listen, listen, Yeshua, I got to tell you, you know, you got mostly it right, but I got to tell you, there is no way that you are going to die. Took him aside, began to rebuke him. Look, heaven be merciful, Lord. By no means will this happen to you. Because Peter had calculated it all out. It's not possible. Yeshua's response, after telling him that flesh and blood didn't reveal to you when he recognized that he was Messiah, now he says to him this, Yeshua turned back to Kepha, to Peter, and saying, get behind me, Hasatan. You are an obstacle in my path because your thinking is from a human perspective. Your calculations are wrong, not from God's perspective. We need to go by God's calculations. Otherwise, it'll never add up. Then Yeshua told his Talmudim, if anyone wants to come after me, let him say no to himself. Take up his execution stake and keep following me. Even if the circumstances seem to be disruptive, God will follow through. For whoever wants to save his own life will destroy it, but whoever destroys his life for my sake will find it. What good will it do someone if he gains the whole world but forfeits his whole life? Or what can a person give in exchange for his life? God is dealing with our life with all of the elements, the essence of who we are. And God wants to establish his kingdom. He wants to establish his way. He wants to give us a recalculation of what's going on around us. For the Son of Man will come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will repay everyone according to his conduct. Verse 28, yes, I tell you that there are some people standing here who will not experience death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And then in the next chapter, he has the transfiguration with the three disciples who were there with him. And they saw a glimpse into the future. But he's saying, your calculations are off. You're going by human perspective and not from God's perspective. And he rebuked him. He understood the sentiment. He didn't want to see his Messiah leave. But he didn't understand all the figures that were involved in the calculations that God was laying out for the salvation of the world. And that is so important. Sometimes we can think that if we can get it together the best we can, then we will experience all good things. Well, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? We need to submit ourselves to God who has our best interest at heart. And we need to move forward. Messiah gave his life for us so that we could experience 
his life in us. It's interesting, too, we mentioned before how in, where was it, in Romans, he says we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in the Messiah Yeshua. And we need to be following in that pattern. Who will punish him? Certainly not Messiah, who died for us. More than that, he has been raised, is at the right hand of God, and is actually pleading on our behalf. He's on our side. He made provision for us. It doesn't matter who's against us. If we focus on the one who is for us, and we allow him to have his way in our life, it may not seem like it's going to add up. It may seem difficult, the circumstances we go through. But it all adds up in God's calculation. He won't leave us or forsake us until he's accomplished what he said he will do. And in the process, we'll learn so much. In the wilderness, it's a place to refocus our attention on the one who has given himself for us. Avinu Malkainu, our Father and our King, we thank you for all of your provisions. We thank you that in you it all adds up. And I don't know what that calculation is. I don't know why we have to go through some of the things we go through. I don't understand how it all works, but I know that you don't want us to look at it from a human perspective, but to look at it from your perspective. And that you will work all things together for good because we love you and are called according to your purpose. Let us not be sidetracked by our own purpose or our own calculations, but to submit ourselves to the one who calculates eternity and who calculates beyond our ability to even count. Lord, we ask you to move mightily in our lives, that we would not despise the day of small things, but that we would seek your face, turn from our wicked ways, and see you restore and heal our land. And that you would reach out to the multitudes that are out there today in such dire straits, hopeless, when you are making available a hope beyond hope for people everywhere, for whosoever will let him come. And Lord, we thank you for your provisions. And we ask you to help us to use your word as a way of calculating your heart towards us. To pray and to seek your face. To reach out to the people around us. To coordinate and see the body come together as a coordinated expression of your life. To reach those in need and set the captives free. We thank you, Lord, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Let's all stand. And as Aaron blessed the people of Israel, so we bless one another with these words. Yivarechecha denai ve'yish marecha Yair Adonai panevelecha ve'chunecha Yisa Adonai panevelecha ve'yosem lecha shalom The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'shem sar shalom in the name of our Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And everyone agreed by saying amen and amen. Shabbat shalom. Greet one another. Join us for the Onik Shabbat at the Beth Zion House for some schmooze time, some food, and our potluck Onik Shabbat. And we'll see you over there. And we'll see you in shul. Invite people to come out. And let's see God do things that are exploits beyond our calculation to let him have his way.
in our lives.